Welcome to Machine Shop Tech Talk. I'm here today with my buddy, Kellen Sewell, and he's from RPM3, and he's gonna do a little bit of a bio here. So just, just to clarify, RPM3 is not about revolutions per minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my field is risk management. This is where I come from. I've worked in a lot of different industries and always thinking about risk and strategy and strategic process. And so this is how we can possibly apply it to uh, machine shops for you. Yeah, and so I know today specifically we're looking at like the ISO 9000 series standardizations, but risk management would apply to all standards if I'm not wrong. Correct. Okay. I look at it when you when you make a statement like that, it's, it's yeah, yeah. looking at it does it apply to a standard? Yes, because you want to be in compliance with a standard. And if you are not, then that is a risk event. And, and risks, I know something that I want to get to in this conversation, we're not going to start there, but the, I, want to, I want us to touch on the risk of doing nothing. I think it's something that's overlooked in industry. But when we're talking risk and we're talking ISO, what do you feel that organizations are missing out on when they're going for ISO when it's related to risk? Uh, well, if they just turn it into a check the box exercise, mm -hmm. then yeah, they're going to miss out on a lot of different values as to what, what they can do for their organization. I always like looking at clause 4.1. I noticed that ISO 9001 has changed the definition a little bit, but basically it says, look at everything internally, look at everything externally and do an assessment on all of this. So I look at that as an opportunity to do, let's do the assessment on the operations and the culture and the governance. And then at the same time, let's apply it to our goals. What's gonna get in our way? How can we leverage this to our advantage? What are some of the advantages you see companies can can have if they actually do this? You know, they don't just check the box, but they actually do an in-depth analysis internally and externally. They're going to find areas that are causing bottlenecks in the flow of, of their processes. To give you a quick example, I did an, I did an ISO 9001 uh, assessment for, an, uh, for a small machine shop, and one of the big items for them that came up was they were errors coming out of the office onto the shop floor. Mm -hmm. So when you're getting your drawings, you know how important that is, right? One little yeah. millimeter out and everything is possibly scrap. That was that was one of the things that came up and, and here it is. Okay, so let's start to look at that whole process, do an in-depth dive and how much value then can we drive out of that by reducing all those errors. And it, it was something that was, it wasn't even on anybody's radar. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly it, right? Unless you do a, an assessment, especially with an outside third party, right? Someone that's not in the organization, someone that doesn't have, oh, it's always been that way, or maybe they don't see it anymore because they're just so used to it being there. They bring in a consultant like yourself to do the assessment for them. And then you get to discover all of these things that were impacting them and reducing those profit margins. Because when you have errors coming to the shop floor from the office, now you've got scrap, now you've got rework, now you've got late deliveries, you've got all of these things that start to stack up for these machine shops. And if they don't do this assessment, they're going to be blind to it, wondering why, you know, they can't be competitive on work going forward. Or, or their cost estimates get all out of whack, right? Because all these little items are adding up, right? That's that's what comes of it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if you start losing money on a job, okay, you raise your rates. But if you keep raising your rates and you become well above the market average... Now you're just not winning anything anymore. I like to think of risk management as a, as a competitive advantage in a stealth mode. Okay, yeah. so, so if you're doing it, risk management inside your organization, your competitors don't yeah. really know that because there's nothing external to see about it. And if you can yeah. use that to improve upon your operations, then that's a huge competitive advantage. And everybody's going to wonder, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, it's just simple risk management. You become that shop where they can't figure out why you're the one winning all the work. And it's because you found that all of the risks and you've gone to work on them to reduce those risks or the impact of those things that you were blind to. So your prices get to stay where they're at and you get to keep winning those works and you get happy customers because if you've caught all of these things, you're not shipping bad product out either, which helps your reputation. <laughs> exactly. It's just the whole cascade of effects on it. You mentioned a, a great story there with the errors that were coming out of the office. What are some 
other common places you find companies are overlooking their, these unseen risks? Um, I, I'm going to talk general yeah, yeah, stuff on this. Course. Looking at different categories, what I've found in, in doing some of these ISO 9001 assessments is that the organizations know how to do what they do very well, right? So the widget that they make is the best widget, bar none. So the areas that I see is not operations. Operations is usually category number four or number five in priority. It's HR, IT, and sales. These are the three areas where those will be the top risks on it. And, and this is what's affecting the whole organization. Yeah, and I know you and I have spoken offline about this, but to clarify for the listeners out there, if I'm wrong, correct me, the the higher the number on these categories, the less of a risk, the less of your attention it deserves, the lower the number. So a number one, you should be working on that right away. A number five, uh, maybe I'll get to it in a few months kind of thing. Correct. Yeah, the, the yeah top, top three categories, IT, HR, and sales. Maybe not yeah. in that order, but depending on the organization. Oh, I was going to say, if it's a sales heavy organization, sales might be the number one thing you got to deal with, you know, like it's going to bounce around depending on the company. Speaking of those three departments, um, well, one, that's probably something most machine shops aren't even thinking to look at, right? They're very much, oh, let's look at the tooling. Let's look at the fixturing. Let's look at, again, that operations side of, of their company. So, is there any commonalities? Of course, speaking generally, right? We're in the world of manufacturing. You don't want to give anyone secret sauce. I don't want you to give your secret sauce away. But is there some general things in those categories where you find that the it's fairly common amongst most of your clients? Not not among those, no. I, I can name those three categories as the top three, yeah, yeah. but but getting down into any of the details, it's going to be different with every organization. And yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the things that I do for my assessments is I always tie it to the strategic goals that they're trying to achieve. So by doing that, then you get very specific about what their possible risks are. <laughs> And that's, and that's another, another benefit, benefit of working, of working with, with uh, that, uh, that, that, that outside, outside assessor, assessor right? right? When, when someone's, someone's coming, coming in to do the review, review is they, is they can, can keep in mind all of the, the goals, the strategic, strategic, strategic goals, goals that you have, and then, and then keep, keep your company, company focused, focused on that. Because it's, it's so, so easy in the day-to-day to get, you know, kind of led around by your nose all over the place and lose that focus. And then you end up working on something that, yeah, it's kind of a pain, but it doesn't actually change anything. And if you had gone to work on the things that would actually push you towards your goals, maybe that thing would have taken care of itself anyway yeah or it would have been a lower priority and and yeah. you automatically would not focus on it it's funny when you when you look at some organizations when you map them all out and I like a four quadrant map and you'll see this big cloud of risks that appear mm -hmm. on it and you know a slice of that is going to be the high risk and then the medium risk and the low risk but that is basically chaos of the organization and mm -hmm. in order to make some sense of it you need to put some priorities in it and that's just what part of what risk management can help you to do. Again, looking back at like when we were talking a little bit ago and you're talking about those different priorities, those different categories, then you know, okay, number one, we got to work on that area first. Number five, uh, you know, if one, two, three, four are already done, maybe we can go to work on number five. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a typical risk register is going to have, you know, 100, 150 risks on it for a whole yeah. organization. And you can't change 150 things all at once, right? So, <laughs> so let's, what do you, you know, mean? let's focus on the top 10. <laughs> <laughs> and then once we get those done, then we can do you know reevaluate and try it again, right? Sort of thing, and that's that's how also you're going to find your ROI. I mean, I I used to work for a utility, and one of the things that we looked at, and it came up on the top ten of our risk register, was the training of of some of the plant supers, and. Uh, hmm it wasn't working so they did a deep dive on it they found out what was going on with it they switched it around 180 degrees and changed the way that they were delivering that training and had a huge production increase plus they got to save a hundred thousand dollars a year who doesn't like to save a hundred grand a year man <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. an extra salary or two, depending on the company and the role that you're looking for. Yeah, it's it's just a matter of what what is the right path. My partner did an engagement a while ago with a company down in South America, I believe, and it was just a division of of the company. They did a deep dive on their on their risk management, and at the start mm -hmm. of it, they told the CEO to write down his top five risks. They put him in an envelope, sealed it up, and then after and excluded him from the from the assessment. Yeah. So after after the assessment was done, they opened up his envelope and his top five risks didn't even make the top 20. Oh, wow. 
like when they looked at the whole organization down there in and really? so they they backed the risk management plan and they went in 12 months they went from losing 15 million dollars to making 15 million dollars so a uh, 30 million dollar turnaround in 12 months <laughs> But there's still going to be people watching, Kellen, that are like, oh, I, I don't need, I can just check that box. I don't need to do a deep dive on my risk. <laughs> a $30 million turnaround in 12, yeah. like you're not pulling my chain or nothing, no, no, right? No. Like... no, no, no. <laughs> so everyone that's following along, this is why we're talking about the importance of don't just check that box, take the opportunity. It's going to make you more profitable. Now, I know you touched on ROI. What about building faith with the team as well? Like when you prioritize it the way you do, how do how do the teams normally react that go to work on these projects? The way I do it is I, I get a lot of input from the organization. I, I would rather have you know more people involved than, than less. Um, yeah, yeah. And I try to reflect all of what they're telling me into the risk register so that when they look at it uh, at the end of it and you know here's this list of 200 risks that they have and and they're looking at it and somebody says hey there's my risk up at the top and we're going to do something about it okay. right so there's your motivation right because yeah. we reflected their words into the risk register and now somebody's going to do something about it so how would that make you feel if somebody right. says hey Here's your risk. You identified <laughs> yeah. this. Thank you for doing that. Now we're going to do something about it. Yeah. Well, I love it because it's getting that buy-in, right? I've worked for a lot of companies where maybe it's the CEO, like the example you gave with the 30 million turnaround, where they're so laser focused on like these five things they see as important. But then I'm the guy on the shop floor being like, man, you know, if we could change this, I could be way more productive every day. You know, like I've got crap lighting in the machine shop, whatever the, the issue is, but there's something where the guys on the shop floor are way more aware of some of the impacts that are going on um, or in the office, you know, the person handling all the, the turn backs and be like, look, this print's wrong. Go fix it. Go fix it. Go fix it. So you get the buy-in, they get to see their, their words up there. You're completely impartial in the process. So it's not like you have any, any dogs in the race. You're just trying to help them identify and assess their own company so that they can fix everything. So how long have you been doing the, the risk assessment side of things? I know we didn't touch on time earlier, but. I don't know, early back in 2014 is when I got okay. started getting into risk management and 2015, got my CRM and took the courses and all that good stuff. Um, but I, I like I like the tie in between risk management and strategic planning, right? So yeah. and then looking back at it and saying, oh, why didn't we reach this strategic plan? Why didn't we reach these goals? And yeah. I mean, I I get a nice live case because I volunteer for that's uh, a I call it a food bank of food banks. Um, yeah, so yeah. we bring it, they, they bring in all the, all the big loads of food and then they distribute it out to smaller food banks in our area. And I mean, we, we set up a, a strategic plan. It was right at the beginning of COVID. We set some goals. We didn't know if we were going to make them or not. Uh, we continually apply risk management all the time through the board of directors. And, and we were able to achieve 70, 74% of our goals that we set like three years earlier. <laughs> so just by keeping the focus on it and, and doing that, doing that ongoing risk management and mitigation and monitoring what's going on. Yeah. I love that because you're tying in the fact that, you know, maybe the people listening aren't in machine shops, but they're in manufacturing or they're in op, they're doing something in the world. I mean, you're talking about a food bank, the risk management can really impact and bring benefit to whatever you're up to as an organization. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome. it's the ability to tie it to your strategic goals. What are you trying to achieve? Yeah, that's such a, you know, it's something I focus on on, on the consulting side as well is, look, let's be outcome focused. What outcome are we trying to generate? And then I'll figure out what's in the way. Because, and it sounds like you have a very similar approach. Like, look, what are your strategic goals for your company? I'm going to help you assess the risks that are preventing you from getting there. You'll, you'll give them a hundred something risks, but you can focus on the ones that are in the way of them doing their strategic goals. And for us, we like to look at it. The, the assessment portion of it should be done very quickly and easily. If you're taking a long time to it, then you lose people's attention span and lose buy-in. You know, are you really getting a better product? But let's get everybody's first opinion on it to see where, where everybody's thinking about it. And then we can go back and reassess at another time. There, you know, the ROI comes on the mitigation. It doesn't come with the assessment. I will be very upfront about that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's 
what now that you know where to go and what to look at inside your organization then the roi then just pops right out and says oh if we change this here's our savings if we do something different this way we can get savings here or benefits i i love that and that's a good that's a good spot to kind of tie up our conversation today and keep it focused when you've got the opportunity to do assessments for your risks, whether you're going for ISO or maybe you're just listening to this and you're like, look, we've never really assessed our risks. It's a good time to start that. And I highly recommend that the people out there listening, they reach out to someone that's not inside their company to do the assessment. In-house assessments are nice, but the, the benefit of having that impartial outside party do the assessment for you, the prioritization happens on a need to happen basis versus what that what someone in the company might be feeling or experiencing or what they think might be the the right way to go. I got th yeah. three things, three things. So this is okay. this is the taught this is the list of three. So okay. the minimum to implement risk management is three things. Number one is identify your risks. So make yep. a list. Uh, number two is mitigate what you think are your top risks. And then yep. number three is monitor that mitigation to make sure that it is doing what you thought it should be doing. Those are the, those are the, that's all you have to do is a minimum. Identify, mitigate, and monitor. All right, so anyone that wants to do their own, you've now got the top three things that you need to accomplish. Well, I appreciate that, Kellen. Do you have anything else to share with the folks out there before we wrap for today? Oh, thank you very much for having me on here, Arthur. It's always fun to to talk about doing assessments and you know what yeah. what organizations should look for and you know is a is a custom assessment better than a a standard assessment? Questions to be answered. I'd be willing to wager that the one that's curtailed to the company is going to have way more value, but I, I have some bias in this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, everyone out there listening, if you would like to get a hold of Kellen, I'm going to put the contact details he gives me down below this video so you can reach out and connect directly. And to all my machinist friends out there, keep your spindles turning and earning.